What would happen if a poor cobbler in England decided to move to India to tell people about Jesus Christ? Well, if God called him to do that, then the world would be changed. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. Today we're going to dive into the life of a man I hope most of you have at least heard of before. But before we do that, I have to mention my book that is available now for purchase. Remember, I'm turning this podcast into a book series, and book one in the series, The Church is Born, is now available. The first 300 years of church history told in an easy-to-read storytelling format. If you've read that book, could you please leave a review because that would be fantastic. Okay, let's jump into today's episode. Travel with me to the year 1761, England. We visit a small village. A weaver named Edmund is sitting next to his wife, England, holding his new son he has named William. The Carey family is not a wealthy family, and they're not well known. No one cares that little William has been born. No one in England cared. 4,672 miles away, or 7,519 kilometers away in India, no one had any idea that a baby born far away in England would one day change the lives of everyone in India. Edmund Carey was not just a weaver. He was also active in his Anglican church. He was a parish clerk. Edmund and Elizabeth Carey made sure their young son William was baptized into the Anglican Church. When William was six years old, his father began to serve as a schoolmaster. William was then exposed to books he had not had access to before this. At the age of six, William taught himself Latin after he found a book on the topic. His parents realized that William had an incredible gift for languages. One day, William visited a revival meeting with the Wesley brothers. William didn't come to Christ at this time, but even though he was a young child, the revival meetings had an impact on him. William continued to learn by reading everything he could. He also learned Greek and Hebrew. He became interested in botany, and he wanted to go to college to study botany. However, his parents were very poor, and there was no way to send him. Although he was exceptionally bright, his future would be simple. He got a job as an apprentice with a man named Thomas, and his job was making shoes. He became a cobbler. William was just 14 years old. His childhood had been full of dreams of great things he would do one day. He had studied and learned everything he could, and now, at the age of 14, His life had been laid out for him. He would be a cobbler. A man who worked with a cobbler took interest in young William and began to talk to him about Christianity. They began to debate theology. William remembered some of the things he had heard as a child when he visited the revival meetings with the Wesley brothers. William began to go with the man that he worked with to visit his church. The church was different than the Anglican church he'd grown up with. The church was part of the independent congregations. They were not part of any denomination, although they were kind of becoming a denomination themselves. One day, William gave in to the Holy Spirit, confessed his sins, and turned to Jesus. A few years later, the cobbler, named Thomas, introduced William to his sister-in-law, Dorothy. Dorothy had no education. She could not read or write. She also had no interest in education. The two were really not a good match. However, William married Dorothy when he was 19 and she was 26. Shortly after their marriage, the cobbler, Thomas, died and William took over his job. His life of being a cobbler was now set in stone. William became involved in a group called the Particular Baptists. This was a new denomination. William was then baptized as an adult. This was a big step since his family had baptized him as a baby into the Anglican Church. I need to do a full episode on the Baptist denomination, and I will in the near future. 
William was part of the group known as the Particular Baptists. The other group was known as the General Baptists. The Particular Baptists were very strong Calvinists. William and Dorothy were very poor. The home they lived in was small, damp, and full of mold. William and Dorothy had two little girls. Both times their babies fell sick and died. At one time, the one baby became very ill and William was also ill and unable to help Dorothy care for the child. When the baby died from her illness, William was so sick he could not attend the funeral. Dorothy's family came to see where she was living and they were in shock at how bad the house was. They helped the young couple find a safer home they could afford and once they moved, William's health improved. However, because of the horrible sickness that he had that was caused by the mold in the home, William lost all of his hair. It was a really hard time for this young family. William's sickness and the loss of two little girls. Then the American colonies went to war with England. Although William was an Englishman, he sided with the American colonies. And when the king called for a day of prayer for all the soldiers, William held a prayer meeting for the American colonies. When the war eventually ended, William was happy to see the founding of the United States of America. Once William was able to work again, he continued his work as a cobbler, but he began to also pastor a small Baptist church called the Harvey Lane Baptist Church, and he also became a schoolmaster. William never lost his love for books, and during this time he read two books. One was The Life and Diary of David Bernard. We talked a little bit about David Bernard in our episode on Jonathan Edwards. While reading the diary, William became excited about the idea of reaching a people group that had no knowledge of Jesus Christ. At the same time, he was reading a book about exploring the world. He became fascinated with cultures and also with missionary work. He began to dream of leaving England and traveling to India, not to make money as explorers in his books did, but to spread the gospel. William wrote a book explaining his idea. He dreamt of going to foreign countries, setting up communities with schools, hospitals, and churches. His dream was to preach the gospel, but also to help improve the lives of the people living there. His book was called An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. It was published in 1792. William was then given the opportunity to speak to a group of pastors at a conference. He laid out the plan that was in his book. A pastor stood up and said, Sit down, Mr. Carey. If God wanted the heathens of India to be saved, he would do it himself. He wouldn't ask you for advice. One Christian historian has said that the particular Baptist society was more Calvinist than Calvin. They believed that the call to missions, the Great Commission, was only for the disciples and the early church. They did not believe it was their job to spread the gospel. They were content to sit in their bubble and argue theology amongst themselves. William said to the group, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. There were a few in the group who supported his idea. Andrew Fuller, John Tyland, and John Sutcliffe. They, along with William, started the Particular Baptist Society for the propagation of the gospel amongst the heathen. They would raise money to send missionaries to India, and the first missionary who signed up was William Carey. A man named Dr. John Thomas, an English surgeon, had been in India and was planning on returning. He agreed to bring William along with him. There were a few problems. One, the East India Company was a huge problem. The company had been founded December 31, 1600 and had, over the last 193 years, become more powerful than the governments. They traded in India, China, Persia, and Indonesia. The English loved them because they made it possible for people to have cheap tea, cotton, spices, and fabrics. By the time of the life of William Carey, the East India Company was larger than many countries at the time, and more powerful than most countries. And they wanted money, lots of it, that's all that mattered. They believed firmly that if missionaries came to the countries, they would bring unrest, and the people would stop trading with them. So the East India Company banned missionaries. How could a company ban missionaries? 
They were that powerful. So it was not legal to go to India as a missionary. That was the first problem. Second problem was that Dorothy was refusing to go. She was pregnant and she also had young children getting on a boat and illegally crossing an ocean to live in a country where she knew nobody was not her plan. She had never lived more than a few miles from her home and she would not go. Third problem, William Carey was very poor and the trip was very expensive. Dr. John Thomas promised that he would help them navigate the legal requirements since he had connections and William convinced Dorothy's sister, Kitty, to come along with them so that she would have family. And a boat captain agreed to take the family for free, since they were doing the Lord's work, as long as they helped out around the boat. So the first few problems were taken care of, and William headed out. William Carey left England for India in 1793. I want to give you some context of the world in 1793. William Wilberforce was still fighting to end the slave trade. The French Revolution was in full swing. America was a new country. George Washington was president. Jean-Pierre Blanchard, for the first time in history, blew a gas balloon from Philadelphia to New Jersey. This is the world. When William Carey set off to England, he was a young man full of hope and excitement about the adventure he would have with God. While he believed fully he would be successful and thousands of people would come to Christ under his preaching, his wife Dorothy had a more realistic idea of what lay ahead. The group was not small. Dr. Thomas and his wife and daughter were on the trip, plus William and Dorothy and their three sons, including a brand new baby, and Dorothy's sister Kitty. After months of traveling by sea, they finally came to the shore of India. However, the group could not just dock with the rest of the boat because they were traveling illegally. So they were put into a small boat and then William and Dr. Thomas rowed the boat to shore away from the docks. They landed late at night so the group could travel through the darkness to a friend of Dr. Thomas. They arrived in the middle of the night, cold, wet, and alone, everything Dorothy had feared. That's when they discovered a tradition of India that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. They were offered food, which they sat on the floor to eat. However, no one in the home they were visiting would sit and eat with them because they were of the wrong caste, and you could not break caste. William didn't understand what they were talking about, but he would soon learn this system that caused much pain in India. At first, things were looking good. The home Dr. Thomas had for the family was very nice, and they had servants to cook their food and clean up for them. William was actually very unhappy about this. It all seemed too much, and he kept asking the doctor where the money was coming from. Dr. Thomas would only say that he had everything under control. He did not. The doctor had taken all the money they had raised for the trip and bought hundreds of worthless scissors. His plan was to sell the scissors and make money. He thought he could multiply their money, but instead, no one would buy the scissors, and he lost all the money that they had. Then, the doctor was arrested because he had unpaid bills in England. In our episode on the Handel's Messiah, we talked about debtor's prison, and that if people didn't pay their bills, they were arrested. The doctor was arrested and taken away. There was no money for the home the Carries were staying in, so they had to move. William found shelter in the poorest part of town. They had no food and they had to rely on people living around them to share their food with them. Dorothy became ill and Kitty was forced to care for the family. Things were looking beyond desperate, but then William heard of a plot of land with a house on it and he was told his family could live there for no rent. It seemed like an answer to prayers. He packed his family up and started the long journey to this new area of India. They arrived tired and hungry, but with hope. The land was beautiful and the house was nice. However, they soon discovered it was actually not available. There was an Englishman living in the house. However, once the man heard their stories, he agreed to allow the family to stay with him. He questioned their idea to live in this area if they wanted to be missionaries. After all, there was no people living in this area. And he planned on leaving himself. That was probably why they had been told the area was free, because nobody wanted to live here. That was because of the tiger attacks. 
Over 20 men had been killed by tigers recently, so everyone had fled. So William and his family were living in a tiger-infected area with only one other man who was English. However, the family did have a warm place to live and food to eat, so although there were fears of tigers, their health did begin to improve. Then, William was offered a job in another town. He would have to move again, but he would have a home, although smaller, and he would have a job at a factory. He would also have access to many Indian people, and he would finally have an audience to preach. He had been studying the language this whole time, but he knew that if he was completely immersed into the language at the factory, he would definitely become fluent. So, William packed up his family again. However, Kitty had fallen in love with the Englishman, and so she stayed behind to marry him. Now Dorothy was moving without her sister, and she took that very hard. William did learn the language much faster while working in the factory, and he began preaching. People came to hear what he had to say, but nobody was interested. One day, William discovered something horrific. He was walking along the shore when he heard loud screaming and drumming. He followed the sound to see what was going on. He saw a large pile of sticks, the body of a young man who had died on top of the pile of sticks. He realized it was a funeral. He knew that bodies were burned, but he did not know about the horrible act called Sati. He saw a large group of men carrying a woman who was screaming for help. She was tied up and then thrown onto the pile of sticks with her husband's body. William realized they were going to burn her along with her husband's body. He ran to try and stop the men, but the crowd of men all held him back. The loud drumming and yelling of the men was to overpower the screams of pain as a young woman was burned to death. The smell of burned flesh made William want to throw up. He ran back to the area where he worked to tell the men what had happened, and he learned this was a tradition called sati, and it was part of the caste system. What he learned was that the Hindu religion taught everyone's soul that dies comes back as a new thing, if they lived a good life, they would move up the caste system. If they lived a bad life, they would move down the caste system. This meant that if someone was of a lower caste than you, it was fine to treat them horribly because they deserved to be lower than you from something they did in their past. In fact, the more they suffered, the better chance they had to move up the caste, so it was actually good to treat them bad. Women were lower caste, and it was tradition that if they died with their husband, then they could return as a higher caste. The murder of women was not the only problem. Babies were thrown into rivers to drown. If you didn't want to have a baby, or specifically if you didn't want to have a baby girl, it was no big deal to throw the baby into the river to drown because the soul would come back as something else. I want to pause here. Sometimes you hear Christians talk about karma. This is the karma belief. It has no place in the Christian life. I also sometimes hear people say they believe in reincarnation. This is reincarnation. It's not just a wrong theology. It is an incredibly dangerous idea that leads to people, usually children and women, being treated very poorly or murdered. Are you enjoying this podcast? Do you want to support this podcast? Well, pour yourself a cup of coffee and imagine waking up each morning with a reminder from our church fathers. Check out our Etsy page where you can find mugs with quotes from great men and women of God. You'll find a link in the show notes. And now, back to our episode. William tried to get help from the West Indy Trading Company. However, they told him that since Sati was part of the religion of the people, the West Indy Trading Company would not do anything about it. However, as William dove in to learn more about the Hindu religion, he learned that the religion did not teach Sati. The problem was that there were so many Indian languages, and most of them did not have a printed version of the language. So the people following the Hindu religion did not even know that the religion did not teach Sati. William saw the problem. The people of India needed books. They needed books in their own language. They, of course, needed the Bible. And he started his dream of translating books into the different dialects of all the languages. 
including the Bible. As he started this project, his son became very ill. Peter was only five years old, and he died suddenly from this illness. Because of the caste system, no one would help William and Dorothy with the death of their child. They had to prepare his little body themselves. William built a casket. They had to dig a hole, bury the coffin. There was no family to comfort them, no church to grieve with them. They were alone. This was a breaking point for Dorothy. She blamed William for Peter's death. She would yell at him and call him a murderer. She would go on to long bouts of screaming, followed by long bouts of refusing to get out of bed. She hated William, and she would not let that hate leave her. She also started to believe that William was unfaithful to her and would scream and yell at him in public that he was a murderer and an adulterer. One day, William was at a breaking point. By this point, he'd been in India for seven years. No one had become a Christian. His son had died. His wife hated him and was seriously mentally unwell. He worked at a factory. His other children were suffering because of the marriage problems. And he had started to translate the Bible and other literary works, but he had no way of printing it. He was under constant threat of being arrested because he was in the country illegally. And he had to watch as young women were burned to death or babies were drowned in the river, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. In a state of depression, he began to believe that maybe God had not called him to India, that he had only a dream of a young man to travel and see the world and have adventures, that God was not with him. In his prayers, he began to see that he had been called to plant seeds and that he may never see a harvest. Would he be okay if God wanted to use him in the silence, alone, without anyone ever knowing about him? Would he be okay if no one ever came to hear him preach. He decided he would continue to serve God. He would not give up. He would sow the seeds, knowing that he might never see the harvest. It was while William was going through this time of depression that two men came to India, Joshua Marshman and William Ward. They came with their wives. They'd been inspired by William and they wanted to join his mission work. Joshua was an amazing preacher and William Ward was a printer in England. The men looked at the work of William with fresh eyes, and they saw some problems that needed to be fixed. They convinced William to move his family again. This time, they moved to an area of India that was controlled by the Dutch. The Dutch wanted missionary work, and they supported him. Joshua and his wife were teachers. They decided to start a school along with a church. They would charge money for the English and Dutch children and use the money they made to run the compound. They would then offer schooling for free for the children of India. William Ward set up a print shop. He began to work with William Carey to take the translations he'd been working on and start printing them. They worked on printing the Bible, but also printing works of India in the language of the people. Then a lady named Charlotte moved to the compound to help. She saw that the Carey children had been left basically to fend for themselves for many years and had become kind of wild. She became like a mother to the boys. It was the year 1799. This was the end of the French Revolution. The school compound was built, and the group had been given legal authority under the Dutch to preach. Dorothy continued to get worse. At one point, she tried to murder William. The next year, in 1800, a man named Krishna Paul became a Christian and was baptized. He was the first convert. William was given the honor of being the one to baptize Krishna. One year after the first convert, the New Testament was printed. At that moment, William realized that God had called him not to preach, but to use his gift of languages. And from that moment on, that's where he put all his effort. He went on to translate the Bible into many, many dialects. Some of the dialects had never been written, and he had to first create the written version of the dialect and then translate the Bible into that dialect. He also translated many pieces of literature, including the teachings of Hindu. He translated the Hindu teachings to show people that the practice of study was tradition, but not religion. So, they could make it illegal. Then, one day, Carey was offered a position as a professor at the Fort William College. He would be paid very well, and he'd be free to travel anywhere in India with no worries of arrest. 
He took this teaching position, and he would travel to the school every Monday and return every Friday. He was teaching and working on his translations. Shortly after that, Dorothy Carey became very ill with a fever, and she died on December 8, 1807. Their marriage had been a difficult one, to say the least. One year later, William married Charlotte, who had been working at the compound and had taken on the role of helping with William's sons when Dorothy was unable to. This marriage was one where William fell deeply in love. While Dorothy had never learned to read, nor had she ever wanted to, Charlotte shared William's love of literature. Dorothy also had never believed in the mission to India. Charlotte believed that God was going to use the group to bring glory to God. One day, the group heard word that a man who had become a Christian had been murdered. He was a close friend of Krishna Paul and the first Christian convert. He was murdered because he was baptized. Krishna was the man who had led this man to Christ. He quickly went and found the young man's children to take them to his home, but he couldn't find his wife. Everyone searched for her, but she could not be found. They soon heard that the funeral had already taken place and that the man had been burned. However, no one would tell them if the wife had been burned, but they feared the worst. Carrie continued to work to have Sati made illegal. A few months later, the British governor general agreed. The practice was tradition and not part of the Hindu teachings, so it could be outlawed. Carrie was so excited, and he helped publish the law in many different languages. Shortly after that, the wife of the young man killed for his faith walked into the compound. She had been hiding so that she would not be burned. Now that it was illegal, she could come out of the hiding. She stayed on the compound, and she became a Christian also. The group had established both a boys' school and a girls' school at this point. They had a large publishing press, and William's family was happy. Things were going really well. Then, one night, a fire broke out. The printing press burned to the ground, and they lost all the books that they had translated. They had to start all over from scratch, but they didn't give up. They rebuilt the press and began the translations all over again. In 1818, the three men, Ward, Marshman, and Carey, established a college. The college was for anyone who wanted to study the Bible, arts, or science. There was one rule, no caste system. Everybody would eat together, study together, and everyone was welcome. Two years later, William started the Agriculture Society of India. He then realized that the Indian people needed their own newspaper so they could tell the world stories from the Indian point of view instead of from a Dutch or English point of view. He started a newspaper and had it run by all Indian people. He then created a library system in India to make sure everyone had the opportunity to read books in their own language. He saw that both the Dutch and the English were being really unfair with the banking that they brought to India. They had interest rates the lowest, 35%, all the way up to 72%. So William Carey started a banking system for the Indian people. He brought a study of astronomy to the people of India, and he was the first person to write in India about forest conservation. While William was doing the work with the gifts God had given him, William Ward and Joshua Marshman continued to preach, and many people were coming to Christ. In 1821, after 13 years of marriage, Charlotte became ill and died. This was a very difficult time for William. Around that same time, a man named John Dreyer became the secretary of the Missionary Society, and the two ran into a lot of conflict. So William had to leave the compound where he'd been working for many years. At the age of 62, William married a 45-year-old widow named Grace. She took care of William for the last few years of his life. William Carey died on June the 9th, 1834. He had lived in India for 41 years. William Carey is often called the father of modern missions. Here's a list of some of the things he accomplished. He abolished the customs of infanticide and sati. He started a college. He started schools for boys and girls. In fact, over 100 schools in India were created. Around 700 people were converted to Christ. He put the Bible into the hands of ordinary people by translating the Bible into 34 Asian languages. 
He wrote dictionaries for the languages that didn't have dictionaries in their dialect. He started 19 missionary stations. He co-founded the particular Baptist Society for the Proclamation of the Gospel amongst the heathen. The organization eventually changed its name to BMS World Missions, and it still carries out the Christian missions all over the world. He created a banking system. He started the Statesman, the first newspaper run by Indian people for Indian people. His life inspired tens of thousands of people to give themselves to missions work. And when God called him, he was just a poor cobbler, a lay pastor in a small church in a tiny village of England. Somebody who had never even gone to college. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Church History. To hear more podcasts, to read some blogs or watch videos, check out my website at lauraleesiemens.com. And I'm going to see you right here next week.